So a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, it's lovely to see you all. And especially a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us from other parts of Africa. It's really wonderful to have you all with us um, in this, this learning forum where we're going to be talking about becoming a mindful practitioner. Um, I am Janine Kirby. I'm the chairperson of EMISA. And on behalf of EMISA, I'd really like to welcome you all to, to this learning forum and uh, to our community. Um, so handing over to Annika. Hello, everyone. It is so good to see all your faces. So I'm just taking it all in and I see some familiar faces. My name is Annika Kirsten and I am a counseling psychologist here in Cape Town, also a mindfulness teacher. And I specialize in the areas of trauma and compassionate inquiry. And I'm leading this forum tonight into exploring what it means to be a mindful practitioner. And I'm very fortunate and very excited to have my two distinguished and dear friends and colleagues supporting me here tonight. Tina Stodel, who is my fellow Cape Tonian. Uh, she is a social worker and a psychotherapist um, yeah, who practices here in Cape Town. She's also a mindfulness teacher and she specializes in the fields of addiction and trauma and employee wellness. So welcome, Tina. It's so good to have you here with us. And then Janine could, yeah, do you quickly want to say something, Tina? No, no, you can finish. <laughs> and then Janine Kirby, who has just introduced herself and, yeah, has taken over the helms at, as the chairperson of EMISA and doing such an amazing job. And it's, um, yeah, so fortunate to have her here tonight um, and looking forward to sharing this this forum with her. So just before I kind of delve into what we will be covering tonight, um, perhaps this is a good opportunity for all of us just to sink into this present moment. It's this moment right here. So closing your eyes if you feel comfortable with that, alternatively just lowering your gaze. and inviting you to open to this moment. Getting a sense of the weather pattern inside your being. This breath moving in and out of the body. And you, you, your being, occupy this space in this time. And perhaps opening up to the largest space of this room in this forum and sharing with like-minded people and exploring relevant topics to us tonight. And just watching with what quality we hold that being curious about what we bring into the session tonight. And then inviting you to take a deep breath in and out. And opening your eyes. 
and inviting you to just take a look around the room. Not your room at home, but this room online and seeing if you see colleagues that you recognize and just feeling into the connection of our community. So as Janine has just um, said in her intro tonight, we're going to be exploring what it means to be a mindful practitioner. And this is a presentation as such, but it's also going to be open to a dialogue with you um, that's part of, of tonight's offering. I feel that there is so much richness and learning and wisdom and storytelling. And it's interesting when Tina and Janine and myself met, uh, the conversation gravitated automatically to us telling our own personal stories of how we came to be mindful therapists, what that involves. And for you in this room, you could possibly also open up to the idea that it is no quick road. You know, the journey is long and you have to dig deep, and be committed, show up as you are. And what that means also is opening up to a different way of being with ourselves, with our clients, with our patients, with one another, in this community, with our families, with our children, in a, in a different way, a deeper way, a more conscious way, awake and aware. So the first part, of our offering tonight will be just about that. Tina and, and Janine and myself will, will tell our various stories. And then in the second part of the forum, we, it was, well, the second part was influenced by an article that Janine is co writing for the Essay Journal of Family Medicine on physician burnout. And we will be discussing three relevant domains pertaining to being a mindful practitioner. One, self-awareness and self-monitoring, which I will speak on. Self-regulation, which Tina will speak to. And accountability and public service, which Janine will cover. All right, so I am now going to hand it over to my friend and colleague, Tina Stodel to start with her story into how she came to be a mindful therapist. Thank you, Tina. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, Annika, and thanks, Janine. <clears throat> it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to speak tonight, to share with you my story that has changed my life um, <clears throat> becoming a mindfulness practitioner. Um, <clears throat> I've always been interested in psychology. So it was no brainer for me that I went and studied social work and psycho psychotherapy at WITS many, many years ago. I don't want to give my age away. So I wanted to help the world and especially alcoholics. Why alcoholics? Because alcoholism was part of my own upbringing. And so I did my studies and my first job was at Sanka, working with drug addicts and alcoholics. I loved it. And at the time, I also entered therapy and my psychologist at the time could see my passion to further my studies in psychotherapy and she herself was firmly rooted 
um, in psychotherapy and she also encouraged me to go into private practice. So this was all 26 years ago and I did all of that. And I went and I did a diploma in psychoanalytical psychotherapy. And this is where my first path crossed with Linda Cantor. We all know Linda Cantor, who is with Simon, started the EMISA course, or the EMISA forum. And <clears throat> on this course, which was part of the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytical psychotherapy course, was also a, a section that included phenomenology, existentialism, Dasein analysis. And I remember Linda's passion for this. My question was, how can you be here if you haven't processed the past? So you have to go first into the past in order to be in the present. And I wonder if back then it was, if it was packaged as mindfulness, would I have cottoned on then as I did this time? But I don't know. So I continued my own journey. Linda carried on with her journey. I carried on my journey for the next 20 years. And I was moving forward, but back into the past because I was doing psychotherapy. I was in search for healing my childhood wounds that also included having a very strict and controlling mother. So I did courses on Freud, I did courses on Jung, Melanie Klein, Winnicott, you name it. And obviously I was in therapy now for 18 years and I was devastated when my psychologist left. My second therapist, I perceived as terrible because she was your traditional psychologist very distant, very boundaried, no warmth. Yes, she was present, but she wasn't present. And I stopped the therapy because I wasn't shifting. And at this stage, there was so much wrong with me, I perceived. What I didn't know then is that I was practicing judgment, no moment-to-moment -moment awareness, and non-acceptance of myself. I tried practicing compassion, but that didn't work. And something in me just wasn't connecting. And I couldn't see that I was trying to feel my feelings from my head and not my heart. And the more I was thinking, the more I disconnected from my heart. And my inner critic was having a ball of a time. At the stage, I also started panicking but I didn't really know that. And my anxiety was through the roof. And by now, the purple had really hit the fan. I'd left my husband with my five-year-old daughter and overnight I was a mom and a dad at the same time. And I was dealing at the same time also with two ailing parents, a mom that was having dementia and a dad that had just fallen through a revolving door at a shopping center and had broken his hip. And enter the lawyers, the lawyer for my dad. We were, we were recommended to go and take this to court because the door was faulty. It wasn't the fault of my dad. And obviously a divorce lawyer. And by now, I developed a big, a big secret. I was a terrible therapist and so afraid of being found out. And I also wasn't in therapy because I couldn't afford it anymore. So at this stage, I also have to mention my brother that is a support and a pillar of strength for me and my daughter is that we were both very stressed. And I had said to my brother, why don't we do a mindfulness course? And again, I spoke about Linda. I said, you know, there's Linda Cantor. She does this MBSR course. Why don't we do it together? And at the same time, my brother said to me, he put a piece of paper in front of me and he said to me, you know, the lawyer that we're seeing, he said, also, I'm very, very stressed and I should go and see his little niece, Lindy. 
I told my brother that Linda Cantor and the little Lindy are the same person. And so my journey with mindfulness started in the MSR course with Linda or Lindy. I experienced something that I'd never experienced before, compassion, kindness, acceptance. And the big one for me was non-judgmentalness. I knew I had to take this journey further. So I was one of the first ones doing the Stellenbosch course in 2013. However, some of you who've done the course, you know how expensive it is. And did I have the money? No. But at this stage, something had awoken in me that I had to do the course, no matter what. So I took out a loan. I borrowed money. I had to relook at my finances at home, being a single parent with hardly any maintenance and having to support my daughter. So after the first course, the first seminar of the Stellenbosch course, Simon called me in and he said to me, there was an anonymous donor that was prepared to supplement my course. And let me tell you, it wasn't little, it was a lot. And something started to shift in me. It was as if my head dropped into my heart. How could somebody do this for me? For me. Going back to the Stellenbosch course, I remember on our second day, we were being introduced to the teachings of Rumi. And everyone was talking about this dude Rumi, and I blurted out, <laughs> who the fuck is this dude Rumi that everyone is talking about? So first there was silence, and then there was laughter. And I had such shame, but relief at the same time, that it was okay that I didn't know about Rumi. I'd heard of him, but who was he? I knew about Freud and Jung and Klein, but not Rumi. And so my training was firmly rooted. My training was firmly rooted in Western psychology and anything to do with Buddhism and Eastern philosophy was airy-fairy to me. Notice the judgment. And meditation was a foreign concept. After all, according to me, psychotherapy is working with the mind and not the body. So since then, my, since I've done the course, my life has changed so, so much. And in my second talk that I'm going to be giving after um, Annika and Janine give their part, I will be continuing and sharing with you how I put my learnings into practice as a therapist. Annika, you want to take over? Ah, oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Tina. And for so vulnerably um, talking about your story um, that brought you up to, 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 to today. And I'm sure that for someone, someone in the room that meant a lot. Janine, should you or I go next? Why don't you go next, Janine? Okay, I'll go next. Um, so, um, hi everybody, my name is Janine and I'm coming to you all from the Far East, that's East London. And um, and it's lovely to see you all from all over the world. We see people are saying that they're coming from all over. We've, um, in the chat, we've seen that people are here coming from uh, Italy and Nigeria and I know we have people from Botswana and so from all over Southern Africa and it's really lovely to have you all in the community. So uh, just a little bit about my story is that I think that as with many of us our stories come from all the people who precede us and uh, while I was thinking about this I was thinking about my own father and that he um uh, was a deep thinker. Uh, he had three degrees um, and he came from a long line of thinkers and missionaries, including Francis Bacon, Dr. John Philip. But actually, I think that 
perhaps the one person who influenced him even uh, one of the most was his uh, grandfather, my great grandfather, who was a postman in Mossel Bay. And he said he was a civil servant and therefore it was his job to be civil and to serve. And uh, the ethic of service came from my father. And my mother, on the other hand, is a very practical person. She's a nurse and at the age of 85 still runs her local caregiving um, association and is always looking after all the old and elderly people in the little village that she lives in. Um, and it comes from a much more practical side. And so I recognize that there are these two elements within myself. Uh, and the other important thing that I recognized happened to me was that as I was born, um, my brother, who was 18 months old at the time, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Uh, it was a pituitary tumor, so that's a tumor affecting uh, the main um, organ for hormones in the, in the brain, which is the pituitary. And that meant that he his first surgery was when he I was six weeks old. He was um, blind thereafter and um, also needed to have hormones artificially. Uh, until he died when he was nine and I was eight. So that the first eight years of my life were really infused with um, with illness and um, being in the field of, of illness and medicine. And so I guess it was no surprise when as a rather confused teenager, I got to matric, I wasn't sure what to do. I decided um, that I'd give medicine a shot. My father said, well, he thought that medicine was a good first degree to have. And I guess uh, when I look around my room, the boards, other things, that, just, that ended up being a little bit um, uh, true for myself. Um, but I found um, in medicine, I found a space where I really enjoyed being alongside people. And uh, after I finished my qualification, I decided to, uh, to specialize in family medicine. And, um, and family medicine really honed my practical skills, my counseling skills, and also helped me become more reflective and self-aware. And I really thought that my calling was to provide excellent care to underserved and poor communities. But um, as I guess with all dreams, they shatter. And I found myself exhausted and burnt out um, when working in a public health clinic um, I think there was a number of things that had happened at the time. It was the early 90s, and so it was the stress of working with HIV-positive patients um, it, and, you know, at the beginning of HIV when there was all the HIV-AIDS denialism at the time. Um, there was a lot of political problems because we were trying to amalgamate a number of different health services, especially in the Eastern Cape. Um, and... I also, but mainly found that just the whole approach of medicine was no longer working for me. Um, and and this paradigm, while excellent for acute and critical conditions, just wasn't helping me with the tools of understanding the illnesses of the patients who I was seeing. And the... The, the, the things I was struggling with the most was that orthodox medicine was only giving me tools to suppress symptoms and not really helping me in any way to be alongside patients as they were on the journey of healing and trying to make sense of and trying to come to terms with. That orthodox medicine um, has no understanding of the intimate connection of the body, the mind and the emotions. Um, and my understanding that what I was seeing was that illness was symbolic and I had no paradigm or no way of understanding how this worked and that there was nothing that was helping me support the healing ability of the body. And also importantly, I just felt like I was in a space of long queues of patients that I had to see and that I wasn't with people alongside people in the sacred journey of being born and dying, but rather just seeing this as a physical rather than a sacred journey. And this came to a peak with me. I see that Hofi is here. Hofi, um, Conradi and I were um, attending the World Conference of Family Medicine in 2000. And I had the worst headache I ever had in my whole life. It was splitting 
throbbing, nauseating headache. And I realized that actually working within that paradigm was making me sick and I needed to leave it. Um, and it was a very difficult decision for me to make, uh, was to walk away from conventional medicine and to, to really go and essentially what was my own journey then, um, because not many people embark on that journey. And so I first learned about chakras, understanding the symbolism of healing. I uh, became a Reiki practitioner and then uh, studied classical homeopathy part-time for four years until I qualified as a homeopath and became a mindfulness practitioner and teacher and have been teaching mindfulness um, for 13 or 14 years here with Barbara Gerber. And that actually my journey wasn't so much about learning new things. It's easy to learn new things. But what was difficult for me was finding that space to integrate these different ways of seeing these different paradigms. So to be able to integrate both this very um, left brain way of thinking, which was very evidence-based, critical appraisal, um, really looking at symptoms and suppressing the symptoms, to integrate that together with being kind and not judgmental and actually following my intuition. Um, to be able to integrate both wisdom and compassion. And um, and I guess that's it. that's the journey which I shall continue and um, which, which um, has given me immense joy as well as um, sometimes um, many hours of sleeplessness. So thank you. Over back to you, Annika. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Janine. And... Um... I can so resonate with the integration of the left and the right brain and the integration of these different paradigms. Um, and my journey was was very similar. Um, I gr graduated with a master's um, degree in counseling psychology in 2003. That's two decades ago. I mean, I can't believe it. And um, I was always my deepest interest was in human potential development. I always knew that in a deep place, but never in my wildest dreams did I think, did I ever imagine that the truth underlying discovering my own potential, and I don't know if I'm there yet, but my own potential and, and those of my clients the truth underlining that would also then mean uncovering my deepest wounds. And my wounds were very deep and it involved a lot of trauma. So trauma was a very big part of my journey in becoming a, a mindful practitioner. And it's something I'm gonna to touch on tonight because I think it's very relevant in this day and age. And that is why I'm so passionate about trauma sensitive and and um, yeah, being so mindful of trauma when when working with in in the mindfulness um, and space. So um, I'm going to come back to the word trauma because for me there was a massive shift when I understood that trauma isn't what happened to me. It is what happened inside of me as a result of what happened to me, right? So there, for me, there was this fundamental disconnection to self, if you can understand that. And where mindfulness has facilitated the process in me meeting myself again. And so I'm going to touch a lot on that tonight. But one step back, I've always been a seeker, right? I, apparently, I came out of the womb just the most curious little soul. And um, I call that part of myself the truth seeker, right? She can be very annoying because she always wants to know the truth about everything. Um, but I've befriended it. But anyway, so she fell in love with mindfulness the moment I, I met I. I was introduced to mindfulness. So much so that in 2012, 
when I was immersed in John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full Catastrophe Living, I booked a plane ticket for myself to go to New York, to go to one of his 10-day mindfulness teachers retreat, which he was co-facilitating with Saki Santorelli. One of the best experiences of my life. I was on a high, right? I was on this in honeymoon honeymoon phase of mindfulness. And I came back, I made contact with Simon Weitzman in, to be my supervisor. I did the Stellenbosch uh, um, program, teacher's program. And I was just presenting mindfulness courses, left, right, and center, really, like for a year, fast lane. But now hear my narrative and hear my story, right? It had to happen fast. So there was, the intention was really good. You know, the intention was pure because I wanted to help and I was passionate about what I was doing. But where there was a gap is that I hadn't done the work myself, really done the work myself. So for me, sitting down, meditating one morning, beautiful winter's morning, 30 minutes into a meditation, phew, all the trauma just came rising to the surface. It was a very overwhelming and a very scary experience, right? Combine that with the fact that part of my patterning and part of my trauma was, you know, this Afrikaans girl, you be strong, you self-reliant, don't ask for help. So I really had to fall and I did fall apart. But there was people that could hold me. So that is why I feel incredibly passionate and very, very strongly about a community, a Sangha. When we do this mindfulness, this journey inward, right, which is a courageous journey, we, we need people to support us. It's important to be part of a Sangha, to be here tonight supporting one another, to have a capable supervisor, um, therapist that can hold you in the process of um, of doing this inner work. So um, you would think that this experience would put me off from mindfulness, but in fact, it had exactly the opposite effect. There was this um, real deep curiosity, this deep it was almost this love passion compassion i can't really it's very nuanced this feeling of this inspired feeling to understand what had happened to me to understand for myself so i could start this healing journey but then also for those that hopefully one day would be able to help because i was sure i was not the only one right and that's been the truth so recently, my year-long intensive training with Gabor Mate um, into using compassionate inquiry um, when working with trauma has fundamentally transformed the way in which I show up as a therapist, in which I show up for my clients, in which I show up for myself. I reflect back on <laughs> uh, when I started out as a, as a green, wet behind the ears therapist at Crescent Clinic Psychiatric Hospital here in Cape Town, um, working in the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Unit. And this was 20 years ago, right? I'm giving my age away, but um, it was very cerebral, academic, methodical, it's all about techniques, quite disconnected from myself and my clients probably quite clinical and and add to this that I hadn't really done the work myself I mean I recall going through my two two years two years of master's degree and professors saying that everyone should go for psychotherapy and me saying to the professors I don't need it I don't need it I had the perfect life I don't need it there's nothing wrong with it Right, so I hadn't done the work myself. So, which meant that I was quite 
pleasing. I needed to be needed. I, I had all these these underlining things that they were coming out in therapy, basing my sense of self worth and in, in how I feel I performed in therapy. Um, no, not that there's anything wrong with these things, but looking back now, I can clearly see, I can see where I was. And I could help my clients, hopefully help them to some point. But had I done the work? Not yet, not really. I'll never forget sitting with Gabor Mate in one of his um, teachings. And he was working with one of the students, was online live and he looked at this um participant with you know this real wisdom and compassion and he asked her are you seeing a therapist and she said yes and he and he looked at her and he said are you seeing a therapist who's done the work and she says i'm not sure so that, that's it and, and for me, when I speak about being a mindfulness therapist, that is that is what I mean. It is a commitment to doing this work. It's a commitment to showing up as authentically as I possibly can. A commitment to my own personal practice. Um, to walking this, this talk as authentically as I can. And to being accountable for my actions. So, I mean, what does that, that look like in, in the therapeutic space practically? Um, it's knowing that it's for myself when, when this process is happening for my clients, it's also happening for myself. This abiding, kind of compassionate, abiding presence for myself and for my client. Creating a sense of safety for myself, for my client. So it's reliant upon the work, as you can see, that I'm doing myself. Attunement, inquiry. So while I'm inquiring for my client, I'm also at the same time doing self-inquiry. It's this constant dance, as you can see. Sorry, my doggy just wants to be picked up. Say hello. Yes. Knowing what my triggers are, as much as seeing what my client's triggers are. And then also the ammunition around that. Knowing my own pain, my own shame, as well as my clients. Seeing when I disconnect, just as much as when my client disconnects. Seeing how my core beliefs show up in therapy, just as much as my clients does. So it's this continuous dance. It's a collaborative effort, right? So we get, I'm going to speak a little bit much, a, a little bit more on that when we look, um, when I discuss self-awareness and self-monitoring. So um, I'm going to end it there. And then, Tina, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk on self-regulation. Okay. So I'm not going to give you a, theore a theoretical background on self-regulation and mindfulness because I think that's something you can go and read up. But more of a, my own experience of self-regulation in my own therapy with my psychologist and then how I showed up with my patients. So, but before I did that, the way I'm practicing now as a mindful therapist is not how I used to practice. So I used to in the past, just like Annika, it was very much more on technique and knowledge and theory. And it was also about that my patients were more important than myself. The more knowledge I had on them and on theory, that's what I thought was the answer. And yes, I worked on myself in therapy, but somehow there wasn't, I didn't make a connection. 
And I came from a place that I needed to fix my patients and get rid of their ailments. And the pressure to get it right and to be an excellent therapist. And at that stage also, I was very boundaried with my, with my, my patients and I had less connection and there was very little heartfeltness and compassion. And I kept up this professional neutrality and I was very analytical and clinical. So what shifted in me? So after, as I shared with you, I did the post-grad course at the Stellenbosch um, University. I started doing my own daily practices where I became aware of what awareness actually is. And it was more about me and less about my patients. And it was the first time that I actually had tasted embodiment. And that's the first foundation of mindfulness is the awareness of the body, the physical sensations of the body, the emotions and the mind, your thoughts. And I'd never done this before. Not like this. To sit, to create space and just to be. And the more I sat in silence, the more I saw, but with more clarity. And I learned what turning towards especially uncomfortableness meant. And I was becoming alive. And although it was hard, it felt good and empowering. And now again, I come into Linda Cantor again who at this, at this stage I'd chosen as my supervisor and my therapist. And we are now two years later, and again, a few things happen. And my daughter's best friend at the time, they were 13 years old, committed suicide. And I knew I needed to go back into therapy again. And so I chose Linda, obviously, as a mindful therapist, because I wanted to also taste and experience not just the theory, but what she's like as a, as a therapist. And often our sessions, right at the beginning of therapy, which is totally different to how my other therapists were, she would go, she would go something like, I would tell her something about me, and then she would say, what are you noticing? And still being fresh in mindfulness, I would say, what do you mean? You know, I notice you sitting here, I notice your flowers, I notice your books, what do you mean? And she says, no, what are you noticing in your body? And again, I said, well, what do you mean? I don't know. And then there's a, lo a long awkward pause and I couldn't make the link. And then she says to me, well, what are you feeling right now? And I said to her very awkwardly, well, I'm anxious. And then she says to me, where in your body do you feel the anxiety? And again, I said, I don't know. And then she says to me, how do you know that you are anxious? And this hit me. What in my body was telling me that I was anxious? And what else was I feeling? And this is where I started to realize the connection with my body. So I never knew how to link my feelings to my body. So our, se our sessions often went like that. I used to see Linda once a week. I have progressed since then, by the way. I, mean, I do know where my feelings are in my body. But it was her incredible patience, her non-judgment, her compassion and her kindness allowed me to be as I was with my mistakes and my faults, and not how I was supposed to be. And that she gave me the permission to just be. And I absolutely felt her acceptance of my human imperfections. So all of this, what I'm explaining to you, is important to come to the place of self-regulation. And I'll, I'll link it just now at the end. 
And in another session, Linda would say to me, can you feel your anxiety? And I would say to her, yes. And at this stage, I knew where and I could do the connection. And then she says to me, can you just be with it? Give it some space. Just notice the anxiety. And we paused. And after a while, I said to her, it's not going away. And I want to tell her very cheekily that her approach isn't working because it's not going away. And she said to me, who said it must go away? And then I said, isn't that what you're trying to do? Well, it's not working. And then she says to me, where does this come from? That anxiety must go away. And then I said, that is what I was thinking. And then she said, there we go. Thoughts are not facts. And emotions need to be felt and not thought through. And can you just give the anxiety some space and acknowledge it? Welcome it. And in the back of my mind, they are noticed. Welcome it. This is Rumi. Rumi's come back again. It will leave you when it is ready. She also said, don't make the anxiety your enemy. Teach from there. It is teaching you so much about yourself. And through all of this, I was able to lean into my own discomfort more and more. And so my own self-regulation started to develop. And I realized that it's less about technique and words, but it's more about moment to moment, unfolding of sensing, feeling and knowing. And I could start feeling the difference between I think I know versus I know that I know. And this is where the heart and the head come together. So self-regulation can't happen with all this information that I've just given you from an embodied place of presence. If I'm self-regulated, I know what is going on inside me through my own awareness. And I'm able to co-regulate my patients, teaching them to self-regulate. So just like Linda has passed this on to me, I pass this on to my patients now. So what I've realized is this. My patients still have their conditions, the stress, whatever they're sitting with, but they are relieved through the mental suffering of anxiety, of self-criticism and judgment. And the catastrophe is more manageable. I think I'm going to stop here because I don't know how much time I've still got. And I know the two of you still need to speak. So maybe I'll stop here and then I will be open for questions a little bit later on. Very, very insightful, as someone has just said. Thank you so much, Tina. Janine, should I go next or you? Um, you go next. Okay, so mine is very much in line with what Tina spoke about. And um, I think we we also refer to one another. We practice in a very similar way. And um, I don't want to repeat too much what she said, but it's it's going to be a continuation of what Tina just um, spoke about. Um, so when I wanted to speak about self-awareness and self-monitoring, I really asked myself, um, what is the function? So as Tina has just explained, what are the function of these? Now, we always just told about self-awareness and self-monitoring, but what is the function? And then letting that land and really thinking about and feeling into that question. And then also asking then asking that in the larger context of what is what is my aim in therapy? You know, do we ever as therapists ask ourselves that? What is the aim of therapy? 
So perhaps just letting that land for all of you. So I'm going to explore self, self-awareness and self-monitoring in the context of um, what I see the aim of therapy to be is promoting the emergence of the in the present self. So promoting the emergence of the in the present self. So on my recent course with Gabor Mate, um, he often speaks and quotes A.H. Almas. A.H. Almas is an author and spiritual teacher. And so, as you know, I, I, I specialize in, in the field of, of trauma. So for me, and for the sake of exploring self, self-awareness and, and self-monitoring, this quote makes a lot of sense. The fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love and support. The greater calamity, which was caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your essence. Okay, that is much more important than whether your parents loved you or not or supported or protected you in the way that they that you need it. So again, this is the good news. Because if the problem was that your parents didn't love you, protected you enough, well, we can't do anything about that and go back to childhood. But if the problem is that there was a, a loss of connection with yourself. Well, that is available. And that is available in every moment. And I'm going to go back to what Tina said. That's it. That's when she started realizing, wow, this staying present with this anxiety, and I've given it a name, anxiety, this feeling, it's teaching me something. Staying present with all parts of ourselves, being able to be with them all. So what does that look like practically? So I'll tell you what happens in, in sessions usually is, for me, the client will be talking about their story and I will intuitively sense that there's something happening. So being very aware of body language, words used, that there's something else happening and then interrupt the client. So gently interrupt and say, what is happening? Like Tina just said, Linda did with her. What is happening for you right now? And if there is immediate release, there's a immediate release of a shift moving into the visceral experience. And then getting curious about what is happening viscerally. Because we stay up here, once again, as Tina said, we stay up here. Why? That's what we know. We stay with the ideas, with the story, because that's what we know. So in a way, that's become our safety, although sometimes it's not safe, but that's what we know. So now we're venturing into a place that the direct experience, which we don't know so well yet, right? So I find right in the beginning when starting to work with clients, it's, it's really difficult for them to express what's happening for them. I don't know if it was for you, Tina. And then to explain what is happening here. Why? Because, and after a while, you know, they'll go back to the ideas and the stories and the concepts. I mean, it's, it's bringing it back again. But there's a very good reason why it's so difficult to explain our states, to, to put it in words. Right, first, we were never taught the skills, but secondly, it relates to pre and perinatal stuff. So our emotional experiences, our energetic experiences, which happen to us probably in vitro or after birth, they, they are stored here and they are pre-verbal. So these happened before words were formed and before we had the emotional language to talk about them, right? So this constriction in the chest, this tightness in the tummy, this heart beating fast, this dry throat, 
this head throbbing, this muscle tension, which probably will come back to the work that Janine also does physically. The, these things were there long before there were words to express them. So that's that's really where the, the, the self self awareness comes in. So sometimes you just want people to experience themselves as they are in the moment without demanding them to put words to it. To just experience themselves as they are. And then if they can't, can start to describe what's happening in the body. And if it's difficult to express or really identify certain feelings, as Tina alluded to. For instance, I had a, a client today who was harsh. She said, my heart, my heart is really sore. Your heart's sore. If your heart could speak, what would it say? So there's some questions we can ask around that. What is happening for them in this moment? And then bringing it back really to the aim of therapy. You know, I really do love that. It's promoting the emergence of the in the present self. Because emergence, it happens organically. You don't have to force it. It's already there. It's there. It's creating the conditions to allow the client to just be with their experience. And for you to be with your own experience, with their experience. Okay, so I'm going to end it there and then Janine, hand it over to you. Um, thanks, Annika and Tina. And um... I was sort of checking a bit to myself because while it is unusual for you as therapist to ask what's happening in the body, it's unusual for me as a doctor to be asking what's happening in the emotions and the mind. And so patients actually come to me with a physical sensation and still find it very difficult to turn toward it and to describe the exact sensation of what is happening. So it's a headache, and I go like, well, what's the headache? You know, it's sore. Well, what does sore mean? Um, and so just the recognition that even though people are coming to me with a physical sensation and a physical symptom, that's what they're offering, still don't have a very clear idea of it and are still quite disconnected. Um, and that actually the physical sensation is the mirror and is the actuality of what's really happening. And so, as I was saying to Annika and Tina, as they start off with a whole lot of words, but when you go into the sensation of this broken heart or this painful heart, you just go straight into the actuality of what's happening. And I, I sometimes feel as if I've just dived straight into the center of what it is, and there's no kind of nice sort of gentle way in. And so with that means that I feel that I have to be much more of a solidity and a presence that can hold what is happening and hold the patient's experience and hold their suffering and their sadness. And I, I refer a lot to Joan Halifax, who uh, worked at the hospice movement, and how she says we need to have strong backs, we need to be uh, feel as if we are a presence and um, have a presence that feels safe and grounded and at the same time have open and caring hearts. So um, thank you um, for that, Tina and Annika. Um, and uh, I like what Annika says also about this emergence of the present self, of, the, of, of, of being the, the, the point of therapy. I guess more um, from a medical perspective, it's really for me around healing. And there's something for me that is uncovering the essence of who you are and the strength of who you are, who can hold the anxiety and hold the pain and hold the trauma and remembering that and remembering your own 
um, healing resources within you that can be mobilized and all the different ways in which you can um, be present to yourself in these difficult moments. And just also just to add that to the other the other point that we were discussing, so it was about self-regulation and self-awareness, was also this noticing of uh, mindful practitioners really becoming more pro-social. And with that, I mean, actually going beyond just what's happening with us in the therapeutic space or in our, um, in our practices, but um, going beyond that and becoming um, it's that... Um, uh, that people, what has been noticed of people who are more mindful as practitioners tend then to be reaching out into communities and noticing that it's not just about themselves, but it's about being part of a community. It's about commitment and service, about being more conscientious. And then I noticed that within myself is that um, as I became more grounded and more mindful, that I also ended up um, doing things like becoming the chairperson of EMISA, um, sitting on the board of our local hospice and um, helping our um, the hospice carers and sisters as they go out to work with um, alongside people who are dying, as well as I'm a board member of SASM, which is the South African Society of Integrated Medical Practitioners. So just a sense of feeling as if... Um, uh, of moving beyond just the therapeutic space. Um, and also just um, as as to end with, just uh, I think one of the greatest gifts um, of mindfulness for me has been the joy of uh, kindness. Um, I remember at one stage, I was very intentional about every day um, embarking on an act of kindness um, and just to end with the story is that I, uh, our, our hospice used to have an inpatient unit and this sounds a bit macabre but every time a doctor fills in a form for cremation certificate you get paid money for it we call it ash cash and I decided that my ash cash was going to be used for my acts of kindness because it sort of felt like it wasn't really mine and we had a young patient in the hospice, 19 years, years old. He had a lymphoma. Um, he was paralyzed as a result. And his family wanted to take him home for his final um, rituals at home before he died. And um, because it was really difficult, because he was paralyzed, um, it was going to be difficult to do that. So out of my ash cash, I gave them money to hire a car to take him 60 kilometers to his village. And his father um, didn't say thank you, but he held my hand, looked me in the eyes, and he said, this is the essence of being human. And um, it's, it's meant so much to me. I'll, I'll never forget that moment. And, uh, and I guess that really touches on um, a lot of what we are talking about here. So back to you, Annika. Oh, Janine, what an exquisite way to end off um, our offering tonight. The essence of being human. Um, just beautiful. Uh, I want to thank you, both you and Tina. Thank you for um, your, your beautiful offerings tonight. Um, and I really hope that it landed um, with all of you in some way, shape or form that you feel that um, you have learned something, something inside of you has moved um, or it could be a benefit for you. And um, I would like to open the discussion forum now for any questions relating to uh, that which we spoke about or anything else that's yeah, of interest. Um, if you want to post some questions in the chat, I can also look at them. But otherwise, just raise your virtual hand. Um, and if you could direct it to any one of us in particular. That, that... Uh, Unati, sorry, you are 
unmuted if you've got a question. No, I don't have a question. Sorry, I'm trying to see what happened. No, I okay. don't have, sorry. No problem. Vivian. Yes. Uh, Vivian, you've got to unmute yourself, please. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I was trying to unmute it. I don't know what this is. Yes. yes. Um, my question is uh, regarding the, the 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 course. Um, I know that it was um stopped for a while. What I would like to know is, uh, like, are you able to attend the course? Um even if you don't have a degree, is it the course for postgraduates only? The one that was run by Stellenbosch. Um, Janine, yeah. will know, I am um, a patient and we spoke about it. Maybe Janine can, can respond to that. <laughs> I don't call her my therapist. I call her my life coach when I refer to her, when I speak to people. <laughs> Yeah, she has um, helped me a lot. Thanks for the question, Vivian. Um, so just to let you all know that uh, the two-year course, which was being run um, in conjunction with Stellenbosch University, has actually um, come to an end. And um, we are now looking at doing a new iteration. The new iteration is going to be much more accessible and will be open to a lot of people. So the first part... The first or the introductory part will be for those who have no experience of mindfulness. It will be four weeks online. Then there'll be a 12-week online um, program, which will be for those who'd like to introduce mindfulness into their workplaces. And then um, there'll be a further um, second tier, which will be for those who are actually wanting to take this into a more professional space. Um, but if anyone is interested in it, it's still all in progress, is please uh, email Lynn and Lynn will put you onto our mailing list. So thanks for the question. Yes. Hello. Uh, my question is for Annika. Um, Annika, you had mentioned the, the aim of therapy to encourage the patient to become aware or to become present. And you also mentioned being present with them. Can I ask, well, what does that look like? Is it being present for the patient or is it actually being present with yourself, which might take away from being present with the patient? Yes, uh, that is a brilliant question. Brilliant question. So thank you for so much for that. I see it as a dance. Yes, I see it as a dance. So if you listen to my story, you heard that 20 years ago, um, there was very, very little awareness and presence um, with my own process. It's completely focused on the client. So it is all very much heady stuff not aware of what's happening here. So right now, what happens is there is, and it's it can be such a subtle shift within seconds, milliseconds of knowing, being very much aware of what's happening within my body, my being, but at the same time, being very present with the client. So, you know, scientifically, I can't answer you exactly how that works in terms of brain processes, but surely there's a way, even now as I speak to you, to be aware of what is happening for you, what's happening in your body language, and at the same time, there's also very much aware of a process of what's happening with me. Does that make sense? Should I go into more detail around that? Or? No, no, um, I do understand. Um, I was just wondering if yourself as the therapist was, was included as well, because I, I thought it would. But I just wondered, would it take away too much attention from the patient who, who should deserve the spotlight? But with practice, I imagine um, it gets easier to shift between yourself and the patient. 
you know, I'm going to also allude to something that that came up in in the work with Gabor Mate is is this, and it's not a notion or a concept. It is trusting your intuition. So trusting your intuition also comes with work of being self aware and and being noticing what's happening for you. So a lot of what happens then in, in therapy is, and that's where I said when a client is telling a story and intuitively I will pick up that there's something happening. You know, that is also reliant on the work that I've done myself. So intuitively being aware of, oh, right, something, I, I noticed something here. But if I was all just in my head and totally immersed in the story, I would have been cut off from that intuitive, you know, it's that that gut feeling that, ooh, okay, there's something happening there. So that's why I think it's really important to be aware of, of your own process. Yes. Is there Thank you. Anyone else wants to venture? We still have lots of time left. Ida. Ida? Ida, we're going to give you an, an opportunity. Just unmute yourself. Yeah, got it. Hi. <laughs> uh, um, two, two years. <clears throat> I find it practical thing from 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 practicing helps me with this as before as I sit down that that just that momentary awareness of 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 the posture as if you are going to meditate and what what Janine has referred to as the strong back and the soft open front so as I as I sit I just ground myself with my feet and 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 just a moment of doing no thinking, just the posture, because we've it's so ingrained in how we how we work, how we sit, how we practice. But the the posture is also an embodiment of, of how we are in the moment, how we are aware, how we show up. So if you show up within yourself with a strong back and a and a caring open front usually takes care of itself thank you Ida this question from Jane is your hand up again Vivian yes uh, sorry <laughs> Yes, Annika, I was, I was, I was um, trying to explain in my own experience with therapy that with mindfulness therapy compared to uh, the therapy with psychologists, I found mindful therapy is more like um, your therapist walking the journey with you. So more like... Um, you know your therapist putting her sh like putting herself in your shoes, so it's more connecting than um you know ordinary um therapy. Um, I just find for me it has made a lot of difference in my life. Um, compared to uh, you know the other, um, I would say um common therapy. Okay. okay. Anyone else? There was a question from Jane in the chat. Yeah, Jane. Um, I actually responded to her and I see it went indirect. With regard to the last question, is it akin to counter-transference in the mindful setting? Well, here I can also ask Tina what her um, experience is, but Maybe do you want to answer it, Tina? I'm I'm answering everything. Um, I can say my my bit. I think 
you know, there's different wordings for similar things and it really comes out of your own approach, I think. Um, for me, it's um, coming from a really kind of mindful embodied approach. Um, it makes more sense to, to talk about intuition um, rather than transference, but you know, yeah, different names could be the same thing. I don't know, Tina? I'm trying to see where was the question? What was that question? Is it in the right in the chat? It's in the chat with regard to the last question. Um, with regard to um, I think you know we, we were speaking about intuition um, and having kind of an in intuitive feel that there is something up up for the client. Is it akin to counter transference? And Jane, do you perhaps want to ask in more detail? Um, exactly what you mean. You don't have to. So maybe if I can come in and just say, you know, in terms of the transference and the counter transference, that is obviously that is that is happening all the time in the therapy. And for me, is that through the mindfulness and my own my own experience of mindfulness and how I show up as a therapist and my own self-regulation that I'm more in tune with transference and counter-transference um, and also bringing it more alive into the room in be between me and my patient, whereas um, leaving it more theoretical or, or analytical where I will then talk about it, what is happening between the two of us, what what is what is she or he saying or not saying and what is she or she picking up and what am i picking up and i'm actually putting it into words and making it more alive so that is what i'm doing different this time round where it is um there's more of a as you said annika a dance in the therapy and more of a presence and being real Oh, and so just I don't know that's the question, yeah. Now, and adding to what you say, it's this real, it's it's being honest with what is there. Yeah. So it's also, it's, it's a courageous way of doing therapy because mm. if you see transfers or counter-transference coming up, it's, mm. it's naming it. You know, mm. we don't have to be scared of it. We're human beings. This is what happens. Mm. So it's naming it. It's, so there's mm. a real honesty, a real sense mm. of honesty and authenticity. Mm. And where I think is, you know, traditional approaches just really, they don't. We keep mm. it under the carpet and we don't talk mm. about it. Mm. Whereas um, exactly like you, you know, mm. it's about, yeah, approaching it. Mm. I, hope I hope it's answered the question. Okay, so we've got another 10 minutes. Beautiful. It is about bringing into awareness what is there and not feel shame about it. Exactly. As, as Tina said, you know, that it could be a really, really important growth point in therapy. It's actually you know, talking about exactly that which is which is happening. Um, yeah. Uh, just from a, a medical perspective is, you know, this kind of stuff, we don't talk about transference and counter-transference. It's not even part of my training. But um, um, the tr traditional healers, if you go and see a traditional healer, they actually work on that as the way in which they make a diagnosis. And so they, you, you as the healer would feel something in your body and then say to the patient, you have a pain in the stomach. And then the family around the patient would say, I agree or we, we agree or we disagree. Um, it's kind of a little bit, sometimes feels like hot or cold, but that actually that, um, you know, traditional healers work on that sense of like, we really intuitively 
feel what it is to be that patient and how it is to be the patient. And that is part of the therapeutic process. And so I think that, as you say, instead of like pushing it away and say, I shouldn't be doing this, or we shouldn't be having this stuff, is actually, as you say, it's this honesty of saying, well, it's here and this can be used as it's all part of this process of something happening between us. So inviting anyone else who has a need to ask a question or just let their voice be heard. We'd love to hear from you. Tanya. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the space. Um, I felt called to come in and share a bit more around what Janine spoke to around traditional healers. I myself am a trained Sangoma who's been practicing for 10 years. And I, I came into mindfulness in the last fourth cycle into the training. And what, what mindfulness helped me recognize is I recall the one called Barbara spoke around spaciousness and coming from African languages we don't actually have a word which speaks to some of these concepts we speak around in English and I believe how it is that we can hold space for transference and counter transferences around leaning into the spaciousness which exists within us because often when we think of the senses, we think just of the five senses, ignoring that there is that space where all of the senses blend into one, where even our joint humanity is. And that's how I hold I hold um, the transference in any sort of therapeutic space is just create, leaning into the element or the sense of spaciousness. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that offering. So we would love to hear from you. We have another five minutes or so. Yay, Sarah. Um, hi, Annika and Tina and Janine. It's lovely to be here with you and with everyone else this evening. And thank you for your extremely interesting and valuable, oh, deeply heartwarming contributions. Um, but I actually have a question for Kanya, if that's okay, if I may ask you directly, Kanya. I was really interested in what you've just spoken to, and I was wondering if it was possible for you to offer a, a, a sort of an example of how that invitation to spaciousness might play out in in a therapeutic relationship that you're that you're part of, how that would actually, you know, as as Tina described in her um, interactions with Linda, if you'd be able to offer us an indication of how that actually plays out in a therapeutic session. Thank you. So to I'm going to try and filter it out of the esoteric and just into a practical. So as Janine shared, as a Sangoma, when somebody comes with a certain issue, you already start to sense into the emotions, the feeling tone, even the physical sensations within your body going right up to the thoughts. So imagine you and I now are in a session. I know from my experience that these feelings, these thoughts, these sensations are not my own, but I experience them so real in my body. So to create the spaciousness is to then look into your body as to where do I find the points of connection and to create perhaps the invitation to maybe place my hands on my stomach if the sensation is in my stomach or in my belly and then ask and then ask you as to um do you connect with 
with with where I've placed my hand. So I always then just check in with the person around as you shared this, as you're sitting like this, this is the sense that came to me. This is the thought that came to me. And to allow then for the affirmation or for the resonance to be there. So it's almost as though I, 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 I offer a piece of my experience or empathy into you as a scaffolding to climb into the container. That's um, thank you. That's such a beautiful expression. That scaffolding to climb into the container, and and it's I'm I'm so interested to hear how how you work with that. I think when I'm thinking of how I am, and I'm I'm not a um I work as a coach rather than a therapist, but very often I'll work almost the other way around, and I'll notice, for instance, um the client saying I notice it in my belly, and they'll put their hands on their belly, and I will kind of mirror that. And it's so interesting to hear about that process working almost in reverse and mirroring the other way around. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's really um, very interesting and um, food for thought. I'm sure I'll, I'll be looking into that further. Thank you. Very much. And, also, and I kind of also explaining how you create a, a place of safety, really. Mm. You know? Because if you're mm. taking on what that, what the client is feeling, you know, can also be overwhelming or so it's it's creating that sense of space and that space also creates a sense of safety right it really does because often yeah. what yeah. then happens within my space is that it brings up my own bias or my own you know core beliefs when i have that experience which is the spaciousness i must create so that it doesn't become about me and rescuing myself from the space and then checking in as to how in your core beliefs, how is that, what does that look like for you? Because I can experience something which is traumatic in my body, but for me, it could be comfortable and safe to explore. And I check in then with you as to this is a shared experience, but how does it feel for you? Wow. Yeah. Very helpful. Okay, so um, just taking a pause there and and leaning into all of these beautiful offerings tonight, um, the insight, wisdom, knowledge, heartfelt feelings, experiences shared tonight in the space, um, and uh, just a sense of real gratitude. Um, Janine, thanks for asking me to, to get this panel together. And thank you for joining me, um, Janine and Tina. Um, I don't know if you also want to say something just before we um, end off tonight. Um, yes, I would. Sorry, Janine, you want to go first? No, I was just saying you are mute. <laughs> you carry on. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm going to just share with you the dude Rumi says this silence this moment every moment if it's genuinely inside you brings what you need so thank you Um, thank you, um, Tina, and thank you, Annika. Um, I think this has been um, a really interesting exploration. Um, somebody asked a question as to whether this would be available, and just to say the recording will be uploaded onto the MISA site together with all our previous learning forums, and you are all welcome to go and listen or let your friends listen in as needed. So thank you all for joining us.